seeing you face to face, God. I know right now we feel your presence. We step out in faith, Lord. But one of that glorious time, Lord, when we'll see you face to face and know who you truly are. And we wait in for that day to come, Lord. It's in our future. And we, we can't wait for it to happen. But with right now, God, we just want to step out in faith and, and learn from you day by day who you are and how your grace and mercy has protected us. And we thank you, God, for all your love and all your grace. In Jesus' name. Good morning. I wasn't good here. Now, the Christmas Eve at five o'clock. Have a short service here with the food, fellowship, and whatever else we have. Um, so, come on. Anyway, I want to share a little something with you from a book by Chris Tomlin. There are seven words in the English translated as praise. They all have a little different meaning to them. It's everything from dancing with all your might to following your face and worshiping God. The one that caught my attention is the word, whether I'm pronouncing it right or not, I don't know, but Barak. And embody the notion of kneeling before God, of blessing, of adoring Him, and recognizing one's position in relationship to Him. It's used to describe worshipers falling on their faces before God in reverence, adoration, and thanks. Scholars also believe that it goes even deeper than that. It, more than just bowing down, it's still the connotation of bending low by keeping one's eyes fixed on the king. To brought is to be transfixed. Solomon used it to describe how kings will lay down their treasures before God. Even in Barak, even the most powerful lay aside their egos, their power, their desires. They offer all they have, their gold, their prayer, their honor, their gaze. What I like about that is because personally I have the attention to stay on the nap. Um, my mind wanders a lot. And especially if I'm in worship and prayer, what helps me to think, really focus on God, is to think of his attributes. Take any one of them. Um, in fact, he's all powerful. He can do anything. All knowing. He knows the end from the beginning. He's a creator. I mean, a person with the right skill can cut down a tree, take a piece of wood, and make an instrument out of it. But none of us can make a tree. Um, or even the seed. If we get a little glimpse of who God really is, um, it's all we can do is to fall before him and just worship and praise him. Uh, to be transfixed on God. What I want to do in prayer for really all the day. Thank you. Scott. Thank you. All right. Good work. Tom, all right, gang, let's grab our Bibles. We are going to be in 1 Peter chapter 5 this morning as we close out 1 Peter. We are uh, we're gonna make a couple stops. We'll be in Ephesians chapter 6 today, or maybe it's uh, chapter 7. And we are also going to spend a little bit of time in the book of Ephesians chapter 6. And so those will be our spots for today. Proverbs 7, Ephesians 6, and then 1 Peter chapter 5. Before we get started, is there anything that we can be praying for as a group? Any prayer requests or anything that we can rejoice about? Yes. Oh, no. Anybody else? To piggyback to anybody that's alone for the holidays, and, um, our students that are alone for the holidays too, that they may uh, 
stay mentally and spiritually strong and connected. Alrighty, good prayer. <coughs> Very good. Anybody else? All right, let's go to the Lord. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this time that you have opened up for us today to be able to come together and to hang out, to be able to share the different burdens and the different blessings that we have within the group. And so, Lord, we, we start by <clears throat> just coming to you and thanking you and um, knowing that anything that we ask you, you have a, a good plan for, you have the perfect plan for. And so, Lord, we pray that you would override the things that we're asking for, for your will, but we do have things that are on our hearts, Lord, and we lift up, um, as Amber had shared about Doug, uh, just pray for all the different things that he's going through, Lord, and all the different challenges that he seems to have going on. Um, we pray that you would use this illness, Lord, to, um, to just pull him close to you, Lord. Um, we pray for everybody that is around Doug, the nurses, the doctors, and everybody that is uh, serving him. Lord, we just pray that they would show him your love and your kindness and your grace. And um, during this time of isolation, Lord, we just pray that you would send in your warriors that are working in all of these different facilities to be able to minister and to be able to be there so that... Um, Everybody isn't so isolated, Lord. And we lift up all of the college students and everybody that is now back home for the holiday. And we know that this one's even more challenging because there's an extended holiday or an extended time <clears throat> for all the colleges. And Lord, so I pray that you would use this time to just um, that they would draw near to you as they are um, yeah, in a more isolated time this year. And so, Lord, just pray um, for fellowship. We pray for all of our college students that are back home, that they'd be able to plug in and get connected back home. And that you would just surround them with a brotherhood and a sisterhood of, of believers, Lord, that they can um, grow stronger in you. And, Lord, now as we move forward to our study in First Peter chapter 5, um, I pray, Lord, that you would speak to us as a group today. And I pray... Um, Psalm 85, 8, that says, I will hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people and to his saints. And Lord, we, we pray for that. We pray that today as we hear from you, that it would, be, it would be peace that you would be speaking to us, Lord. As we dig into just tough, tough subjects today, Lord, I pray that you would be guiding us with your peace. <clears throat> and that as we were, you know, as we learned about how to raise up leaders, how to protect ourselves from the enemy and the importance of doing life together, Lord, I pray that you would just guide us with your word. Give us your peace. It is in Jesus name we pray. Amen. Amen. Gang, I'm going to start us off in Matthew chapter seven as we close out first Peter today. And I want to read for us. Um. You know, the verse that we kind of got started with, which came from Matthew chapter 7, um, verse 24. And, we, and it kind of kind of catapulted our, our whole time uh, within First Peter. And in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus says, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on the house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But whoever hears these sayings of mine and does not, does not, do, does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on the house, and it fell, and great was its fall. So we've looked at kind of this, this verse as, as just a really great point for us to get into 1 Peter as we've been looking at kind of a, a wise way to do things and then a foolish way to do things. And, you know, that there's, there's, when we hear these things, when we hear what the Lord is saying to us, we can either stand on them, which is going to be firm and solid, or we can say no thank you, which is then foolish and, and kind of the sand to stand on. And today, as we close out this chapter, we're going to see that that's even more apparent. And, and we're, we'll look at three things. Peter is going to instruct us on what we should be looking for when we raise up leaders. 
Then he's going to do this very interesting transition to where he's going to talk about Satan for a little bit. And so what does it look like to protect ourselves against Satan and against the way that he attacks? And then at the end, he kind of does a neat little thing, like he kind of gives a couple shout outs and closes out the letter. And so in each one of those scenarios, we're going to look at, okay, when you, when you were given this information, which I think can be difficult sometimes, there's two things that you can do with it. You can say, I'm going to stand on it or I'm going to you know, kind of let this go. And so there's going to be, you know, we can stand on this solid spot or we can stand on the sand. And so in each, each case, we'll see there's kind of two different directions that we can go to. And so <clears throat> let's close out first, Peter. Let's look at kind of how he gets us started off. And, and again, the application, if you're the type of person that says, man, just tell me what to do. This is a great study for you because he's going to give us, even with leaders, I think he's going to give us over 10 things to look at when it comes to picking leaders. When he talks about the enemy and the way that he attacks, we'll look at the different things that we can do to kind of protect ourselves against that. Um, so again, we'll look at some wise things to do and some foolish things to do. But let's pick it up where we left off last week. And that is in chapter 5, verse 1. So he starts out by saying, The elders who are among you I exhort. <clears throat> to the elders who are among you, I exhort. Now, next to exhort, we could write address. And typically, when we talk about an exhortation, we talk about encouragement. But the, best, the better way to kind of understand this section is I'm going to address the elders. Not so much, you know, it is encouragement, but he's going to say, guys, I want you to focus on this. Now, when it comes to how we pick leaders and then for those leaders, this is what we should be doing within the fellowship and this is what it should look like. Now, it's very interesting that he starts out by saying to the elders who are among you, I want to address these things. And so he's going to talk about the importance of having not even just elders, but order within the fellowship. And you go, well, you know, what's the, what's the big deal and why does he bring this up now? We're going to go into kind of how Satan attacks us, but one of the biggest areas that we see the attack is within church order. If you think about it, when we come together and we do this, we are truly believing that God is going to speak his word to us and that people can come to know Jesus for eternity, that we're going to grow and grow in him every single time that we come together. And so every time that this happens, Satan looks on and goes, this is not good. And so what's the best way for him to mess this up is to infiltrate the church service. And so often we see that with order. You know, just look at the Corinthian church. The, the, the first letter to the Corinthians was they were totally out of whack. Like they were, they were so messed up. The whole letter is about, gang, you got to have order within the church. You had a guy that was sleeping with his mother-in-law. They were getting hammered when they were doing communion. Right? They had all kinds of things that were a problem. They had people that were getting up and yelling during the service, and he was going, you can't do that. you got to have order so that everybody can grow, so that people can come to know Jesus. And if we're out of order, well, when we invite people in, they're going to go, these Christians are bonkers. They're not in a good way. It's weird. And so that's why it's important for us to have order whenever we get together and we do service. If you'll notice, there's different things that we've talked about, you know, that, that when we do a church service and, you know, we don't have people speak in tongues whenever we're doing a church service. And the reason for that is, is that it's not that we're against speaking in tongues. It's just it's out of order. We believe that right now the Holy Spirit is speaking through this Bible study. So if the Holy Spirit is speaking through the teacher, well, then why would the Holy Spirit interrupt himself? By speaking in tongues. And so it comes down to order because if somebody were to come in and they were to go, why is this guy gibbering while this guy's teaching a Bible study? You guys are, it's out of whack. And so to the leaders, it's our job to keep order. That comes to the person that's teaching the Bible study. That comes to the people that are leading worship is that we have to have order. It can't be, can't be chaos. And so he starts off by saying to the elders who are among you, I exhort or I address Okay, so then if you go to that word elder, okay, right next to it, I'm going to butcher the pronunciation, but next to it is this word um, presby presbyteros. Okay, and, and, and that word is where we get our English word for Presbyterian. 
what, 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 what exactly does that mean? Well, Presbyterian is not just a denomination. It's actually a style of church government. Okay, so there's really four types of church governments that we know of. Uh, Presbyterian, Episcopal, uh, uh, Congregational, and then a connection, kind of a community-style church government. Right? And so the, the two that we see within Scripture are the Presbyterian and then the Episcopalian. Now, where we get the word Episcopalian from is if we go back to 1 Timothy, where it, where it uses the word bishop or pastor, it's that word um, Episcopal. And so you go, okay, I'm, I'm getting a little bit lost here. So let me bring it into the different styles that we have. And then you go, okay, well, where does Calvary Chapel fit and where do we work you know into all this so in a, in a presbyterian style of church government you have a group of elders that are kind of in between god and the church they then pick a pastor and then you have the congregation underneath of that okay in a episcopalian style you would have god and then you would have the pastor then you would have the elders and then you would have the congregation okay in a congregational style you would have god then the congregation, then you would pick a pastor or the elders. Now, in this connection community style, that would be like a conference. So you would have different bodies that would then kind of lead where everybody would go. And you go, okay, what's the pros and cons of each one and where do we hang out? Now, the two that we don't see within scripture are the community uh, connectionism or the <coughs> congregational style. We don't see it anywhere in scripture, but we see it a lot in church, uh, churches across the country. Now, the problem with these styles of governments, again, I'm not against anything. It's just here's some of the issues that you have is that a lot of times when it comes to a congregational style, um, voting in the congregation can move and they can shape the way that the church goes. So if you don't like the way that the pastor teaches, you go, this guy talks for way too long. Well, you could vote him out and then the way that you would go. Let's say that you don't like the way that our, we view marriage, right? If you got enough people within the fellowship, you could say, okay, we are going to vote and to change our stance. You see a lot of problems right now because you have a, a group of people that become the majority and they say, we're going to change the way that we have traditionally believed. That's why we see a lot of splits that are happening within denominations right now. So those are some of the problems that we see there. Um, when it comes to the Presbyterian style, okay, you have the elders at the top, and then you have the pastor underneath, and then you have the congregation. Now, what's good about that is that the pastor has really strong accountability. What's bad about that is that the pastor can become what is called a hired hand. Okay, and that means that... Uh, the elders are the ones that are kind of picking the pastor and the pastor can get to the point of where if things aren't working out, they can, you know, we'll just move on to the next one. Early on in, in when I was getting into ministry, I was approached about a position at a, a Presbyterian style. And I said, no, thank you. I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not interested at all. And they said, well, why not? And I said, well, you know, because I'm going to lay down my life for the congregation. And that's what Jesus has called the pastor to do. And I think it'd be very difficult to do that in that style. It's just not, it's not, not for me. And they said, well, we're really having trouble keeping a pastor. And, and I said, that's it's probably going to continue that way because that's one of the struggles is, you know, you have people that will move in and out. And if, you, you know, if you're around a fellowship where every two or three years, the pastor's kind of going in and out, that can be a problem of the Presbyterian style of government. You go, okay, well, where do we hang out? Well, we hang out more in the Episcopal style. And what that means is you have the pastor or the, uh, the and again, elder, pastor, um, bishop are kind of all interchangeable throughout Scripture. Um, it's not even just a New Testament word. We see elder all throughout Scripture, right? When Moses was called by God, if you remember, uh, his father-in-law came to him and said, listen, you're, 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 you're wearing yourself out. You're ministering to every single item that comes up. You need to put men in charge and delegate some of these things. And so he picks 50 men and he puts them in charge. Okay, those would be like your elders. Um, the elders are those that are mature in the faith, but they're not always the oldest ones within the church. 
But typically it should be, right? Because as you grow in your faith, you're going to get, you know, a little bit more wise. Okay, so um, how, how we set things up, right, is that we have the pastor that is up top. And I, I think that that is the best way to do things. Um, the reason being is that the pastor is then able to go to the Lord and ask for direction, Underneath of that and almost side by side and how we do it is the board of directors or the elder board. And that's your, your Presbyterian group is there. Now, with our fellowship, what we had happened was because we didn't have a church before, okay, the, the board of directors or the elders were picked first. Then they, you know, they basically watched how our fellowship interacted. And after five years, they said, okay, we are going to pick the pastor. Okay, so we're in an interesting point where the accountability for the pastor is the board of directors. And I wouldn't necessarily say that it is one on top of the other. I would more put them kind of side by side. Um, The board of directors has the ability to take the pastor out of that role. But how we kind of function is, is that we have the, the bishop or the pastor seeking the Lord. I think that there is a lot of freedom for the fellowship to be able to move that way. Here's the problem. When a pastor abuses that power, it's destructive for an Episcopalian's type. It, it's, it, we read about it, right? A pastor falls into an, you know, an affair, and you look around and you go, man, where was his accountability? And again, what I would share is that the problem that I see with this style isn't necessarily the accountability. I think it's how we pick pastors, And I think that if we picked pastors in the right way, I think that it would be easier for us to have this process. Let me me give you an example, right? When we're, we're, we're right now raising up the next or the first group of deacon and deaconesses within our fellowship, and we are using 1 Timothy chapter 3, Titus chapter 1, and we'll also be using 1 Peter chapter 5. Now, that's typically not the way that we pick leaders, is it? This last year, there was a large, one of the largest churches in our country. They had lost their pastor who had, you know, for bad reasons, fell. One of the largest churches in our country. And in the job description, right, part of what they were looking for in a pastor was you had to be able to speak to over 5,000 people. You had to be able to speak to multi-campuses. There was hardly anything in the job description that had to do with the qualifications for being a pastor. Now, whenever we do that, we can't be surprised when we've picked a pastor that is an entertainer and not a pastor. And so what happens is we get somebody that is a great communicator, but we want them to be able to stand up and to be these things. But we didn't clear them by these things. And so when the person is a really good communicator but not a very good pastor, it shouldn't be any surprise when that person falls because they're a very good communicator and not a very good pastor. And so our encouragement, or I guess what we're trying to do here, is let's stick to 1 Timothy chapter 3, Titus chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 5, and let's make sure that we're picking the right person and not looking for a really good communicator. Now, is it important that we have good Bible studies and that we're learning? Yes. But as we'll see here with Peter, it is much more important that we are looking for the qualifications of a pastor. Here's one more encouragement. The church that we came from, we had the worst case scenario happen. Our pastor was having an affair. Here's the encouragement is when it happened, okay, the woman that he was having an affair with, she was getting ministered to by another pastor. She then shares, hey, I'm having an affair with the pastor. He gets out his phone. He calls up the pastor, puts him on speakerphone, and says, this is what's going on. At the end of the conversation, he resigned from the position. Right? We had an awful next couple months where the church was going, what do we do now? But here's the thing. The accountability actually worked. The process that was set in place to make sure that those things don't happen, it did actually happen. And over the next couple months, we picked another pastor. And was it embarrassing for a while when all this happened? Yes. Would I pick any other church to be a part of? No. 
I'm still incredibly proud to be a part of Calvary Chapel, Calvary Chapel, Fort Lauderdale. I think that it is a beacon. Did they have a really bad situation happen? Yes. Is that probably going to happen to more churches? Yes. I hope that never happens here. But I would still pick the Episcopal, the Episcopal style because I think that even when you take all of these things into place, this would still be the style that I pick. So I just want to go over a little bit of history about when we say elders, what exactly do we mean when we say elders? But let's move on. So he says, the elders who are among you, I exhort or I address. I, who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Isn't this interesting? Look at the type of person that Peter is. Now, if anybody was going to kind of tout who they were, it was Peter, right? This is a guy that people, large groups of fellowships believe was the very first leader of the church. And he's writing a letter by how to do church. And notice that there's no mention of his position. There's no mention of, hey, make sure that you set up your church like this. Guys, you need to meet on Saturdays or you got to meet on Sundays or you should have pews or chairs or screens or he doesn't say any of those things. In fact, he doesn't even call himself anything besides I'm a fellow elder. It tells you the type of person that Peter really was becoming as a church leader. And that's what we should be looking for. Not somebody that's going to lift themselves up, but somebody that says, hey, it is equal ground at the foot of the cross. And so he says, I'm a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ. That's, that's who we are. We're, we're doing this whole thing together. <clears throat> and I think Peter would probably share, listen, don't, don't lift me up on a pedestal because you can read about all my mess ups. Three times I totally blew it with the Lord. told Jesus that I would never leave him and then I forsook him you know just a couple minutes later and we tend to you know want to put put Peter up on this block he goes no just fellow 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 elder I'm a witness I've seen what Jesus has done and then he also says I'm a partaker of the glory that will be revealed then he addresses this group he says shepherd the flock of God which is among you. Now, if you have another version of, of, uh, besides the new King James, what does your verse two start with? Shepherd. Shepherd. Anybody else? Feed. Feed. Anybody else have a different version? Okay, good. The, The King James, it actually says feed there as well. So next to shepherd, you could write feed. Um, which I, I think is one of the main things that we should be looking for when it comes to an elder, a pastor, a leader in the church. And that's the number, the number one job that I believe that the person that, that leads this fellowship has is to feed the group. And it's the word of God. Amen. If you guys ever come here and I don't say, get out your Bible, take off. Head for the hills. Find some other place. Okay, because this is, this is the most important thing that you guys could be getting. And when you think about it, why in the world else would we come together? There's a lot more people that are more interesting, more entertaining, you know, could probably give you more life lessons than I could. If we're not coming here to hear from, from God, then why? What's the point? We're believing that right now we're hearing from God and I'm just kind of a microphone to go, hey gang, here it is. And so the number one job that we should look for in a a shepherd or a pastor is one that feeds the group, the flock of God, he calls it. So we need a shepherd, we need somebody that feeds the flock. And then he says, which is among you. Okay, so the next thing that we should look for in a pastor and a leader and a a deacon, a deaconess, is that it, it's got to be somebody that's among us, that will do life with us. And we've got to be careful. 
if we're you know trying to pick somebody that is very well to do within the community those are not the things that we're looking for as servant leaders and we talked about uh is it in uh, not that long ago about not being partial to people that came in. And we've got to be careful with that with leadership because that's kind of the temptation is somebody that comes in is powerful. Hey, let's get them involved. We've got to fight against that. So if LeBron came in, right, we don't want him up here speaking in the next couple of weeks. And that's our temptation is, oh my goodness, we've got to let this person share. That, 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 that's not necessarily what we're looking for whenever, whenever people come in. So we need somebody that is, that is among us. And it says serving as overseers. Serving as overseers. And so servants. Next thing that we look for here is servants. Um, next to servant, you could write minister. Listen, as we start following Jesus, we all become servants or ministers. You go, Ben, you're the minister. I'm, I'm one of them. So are you. Our job is to be servants, and we're, we're looking for those that are serving, right? The, uh, we, we kind of the way that we do, um, <coughs> we, we put people into different places is, is that we're just trying to confirm what the Lord is already doing. That's how they picked me for this position. They just looked on and said, he's been doing it for five years. Here's a track record of all of the different ways that we have seen these things happening. And that's exactly what we should be looking for, right? Is somebody that, no matter what, they would just end up doing this. So we want somebody that is a, a servant. And they serve as overseers. And again, we're, we've talked about kind of the, the importance of a, of a leader being able to, to make sure that the services are being overseen. And then it says, not by compulsion. Next to that, you could write force. We don't want somebody that leads by force. Not somebody that pulls people, but guides people. I heard a pastor say at one time, Satan pushes people out, God guides people out. That's what we're looking for with leaders. We, we shouldn't be pulling people into positions. We should be guiding. Not by compulsion, but willingly. Next to willingly, you could write voluntary. And for the for the when we're when we're picking leaders, we should pick people that will that don't need to be paid to do these things. That would just man, if 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 I if money was never an issue, I would do this anyways. So we want we want leaders that are um, even if they weren't paid, they would be doing it. And then it says not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. Okay, again, anybody else have a different translation? What does it say there about the not for dishonest gain? Sorted gain, not for sorted of gain. Not for sorted of gain, okay. And not greedy for money. Not greedy for money. Does yours have another? Yeah, it has for not for filthy lucre. Not for filthy lucre, right? That's the King James. It says not for filthy lucre. We don't want we don't want people to serve that are you know that that they're looking for filthy lucre, right? When's the last time you heard filthy lucre? But when it comes to servants, you know, if somebody comes in and they say, yes, I will, you know, I'll be a part of the prayer team. But what's the position pay? This is yeah. not for you. Yeah. And, and, and we've got to be careful because that's a temptation right now. Um, there's pastor positions that pay huge amounts of money. And I've read about different pastors that have been negotiating these retirement deals that are in the millions. And it's tough. It's tough. You know, if you, you look around, there are fellowships that um, their music ministry is bringing in tens and millions of dollars just from YouTube revenue. And I've looked on and I go, man, I cannot imagine that battle. If you have a worship band that just hits it big and you get to the point where they're putting videos out and they're getting millions and millions of views i can't imagine that temptation because I, I i know what the social media revenue is for that you're talking about tens and millions of dollars that then come in how do you how do you deal with that Whew. it's scary because those that are in that position it's also saying you don't want people that are in it for the money but then when you have this money come in how does it get dealt with 
That's something that we just, we have to be aware of. And that doesn't mean that, you know, that when the Lord blesses a ministry and they see it blow up, you know, that doesn't mean that it's a bad thing. It's just something that we've got to be careful of. Pastor that I really enjoy, he wrote a book and it blew up. He sold millions and millions of books. What's neat was that he, it terrified him. He ended up giving away the rights to that book because he just went, Lord, it's, it's, it's too much for me. That's a good pastor's heart. Person that looks on and goes, man, I, I just, I don't know, Lord. It's not that I'm, you're blessing me, but I just, I, I want to be careful of it. Those are the types of people that we're looking for to serve. So not somebody that is after filthy lucre. <clears throat> not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. Nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. Again, we don't want, you know, somebody that is lording over a fellowship and do this because I said so. But it says, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you. And that's that's the interesting thing, right, is that Leaders are to steward those that the Lord puts in front of them. And that's for anybody that's in a position of leadership. You know, if, you're, if you're working in a job and you have 20 people reporting to you, God is calling you to be a steward over all those employees. But here we're talking about elders and pastors. It says, nor is being lords over those entrusted to you, but being an example to the flock. And when the chief priest appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. So again, we want want to have leaders that everybody else is hopefully able to look to and say, that's a good example. One of the things that drew me to to our church in Florida is I looked on at my pastor and I said, I want to try to walk like he's walking. I saw the way that he interacted with his wife. I said, man, I, I would like my marriage to look like that. And I would ask him questions. How do you guys do things? How do you set things up? Do you guys go on dates or what do you do? What's the secret? You read books together? You go on conference? What do you do? And for years, I met with him every Friday. And I would just, you know, I want to emulate. Great biblical principle. Paul said it. Follow me as I'm following the Lord. And so those, that's who we should be looking for. Those that within the group we go, hey, listen, they, they do that well. And that's what we should strive for, to be an example. Because then it, it says here that when the chief shepherd appears, okay, that we really want people that are trying to emulate and walk just the way that Jesus does, that serves the way that Jesus did, because he's the chief shepherd. That's the interesting thing about the church. That's the thing about the church at Calvary Chapel Tiffin. And that's what, when we try to talk about things here, I I try to take myself kind of out of this position because hopefully this church is going to be here until Jesus returns. And if that's in 200 years, hopefully the things that are put in place right now are going to be strong for the person that comes in next. And so when we look at, okay, there's accountability that we've seen struggles. Okay, what, what do we see at different churches? Well, pastors having an affair. Okay, so how about if we got the board of directors connected to the pastor's wife? Okay, so if there's anything wrong with the pastor's life, the pastor's wife has the ability to go, I'm seeing these things. These are problems. And so right now we have that set up within our group. How do we make sure that there is better accountability? And how do we put things into place so that those that are in these positions of leadership have the ability to, to get help? Or to have the, you know, the, the discernment to be able to get poured into. <clears throat> it says that when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the clown of glory, which does not fade away. And so we have a prize that we're aiming for as leaders. And then it says something very interesting here. It says... Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed in humility. 
Now, this is what's really interesting here and that we've got to be careful of is that when we put leaders in place, it is such an important thing because we've gone over the last year or so that we as a group, we have to submit to those leaders. And that's why it's important for when we're picking different leaders because then you have the whole process of how a fellowship is set up. And it's like we, we talk about through premarital counseling. To the wives, we say, listen, be very, very careful with who you're picking. And so as we go through the premarital process, I will continuously ask, especially the wife or the soon-to-be wife, is this the person that you're going to pick? And typically, you know, there's, there's stars in their eyes and, oh, oh, absolutely, he's the best. Yes. Are you sure? Are you sure? Are you sure? Are you sure? Because a year from now, when you guys are married, this is the one you're now coming into what submission looks like in the marriage. And that's the person that is going to be leading your family. Hey, if he loses his job, is he going to go find another one? Is he going to be hard at work? If you guys are struggling to make ends meet with one job, is he going to go get a part-time job to help for it? If you want to stay home and do this and you want to do that, is he going to work to make that happen? Because you're now in submission to that. And that's why it's important for us to really be careful with how we pick leaders. Because then, once they're into these places of, of leadership, we then have a process that we have to adhere to. So over the next couple months, as we talk about this first group of deacon and deaconesses that we're raising up, I'm actually going to bring them up in front of you guys. And you're going to have a couple weeks to say, hey, you know, that person robbed the bank or who knows, you know, but you will have the ability to go, hold on, you know, that guy, Ben, he took my shovel two years ago and he broke it and he never gave it back. We would want to know those things so that we can sort them out before we put them into positions of leadership. And that doesn't mean that anything that comes up, you look on and you go, oh my goodness, I did borrow your shovel. I am so, we have the ability to interact with them and sort them out, but that's going to be part of our process. So he says, likewise, younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. <clears throat> Isn't that a good word? It says God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And why do you think he put this here right after he talked about submission? Because we struggle with submission. We go, I don't know. I don't know about this whole submitting and marriage and within the church and It's actually everywhere. If you work at a job, you have to submit to your boss. Start driving down the road here. You're submitting to whatever the laws are within your community. And those that are proud are the ones that are going to struggle. And what he says here is you got to be really careful if you're prideful of these things. Because it says that God resists the proud. And it says, but God gives grace to the humble. So if this is an area where you look on and you go, man, I do. I struggle with submission and I struggle with authority. Take that to the Lord. Because it says that he will resist you if you you are dealing with pride. But he will give you grace if you are humble. In verse 6 it says, therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Casting all of your cares upon him. For he cares for you. For he cares for you. Just a good word there about the importance of being humble. Um, Next to humble, you could write lowly. That is a phrase that Jesus used, for I am lowly, humble and lowly. Okay, so that doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, you, you look down on yourself. It's just that you have a good picture of who you are. Jesus was the king of kings, the Lord of lords, and he said, I'm, I'm lowly. I have no problem getting down to serve. I, am, I came to serve. So humility is a very good thing. It is an encouragement for us here. So when it comes to picking elders, when it comes to picking leaders, these are things that we can look for. And again, the wisdom or the the stones that we can stand on here is that when it comes to these, what was it, 10 things to look for here with elders? 
is that we, we should use these when we pick leaders. We should look at 1 Timothy chapter 3, the book of Titus chapter 1, and 1 Peter chapter 5. And these are the things that we should be matching up and using as a plumb line. And the way that, that, that we do things here at Calvary is that it isn't just for the pastor. It isn't just for servants and leaders and serving in different ministries. The way that we set things up is um, we do it by families first. And so husbands, you should be aiming for 1 Timothy chapter 3, Titus chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 5 as your plumb line for what you should be doing as the leader of your household or the shepherd of your household. Wives, this is what we should be using as a plumb line for our husbands. If you're single in here today, this is what you should be looking for whenever you date. This is going to be the leader of of my household. This is what I can use. And it's solid ground to look on and to say, okay, here's where I stand. And it doesn't necessarily mean that these things are a no-go if you don't see them, but it gives you the ability to know the areas that you need to work on. The other day I was riding in the car with my five-year-old daughter and we're starting to learn about different things that she's going to be dealing with as she grows up. And I, I opened the door for her and I said, listen, when you start dating, if a boy does not open your door, you tell him, listen, I'm going back in the house. <laughs> she said, why, dad? She, you know, why are we talking about this? Because it's important. Okay, it doesn't mean that all, all these guys are going to know to do that, but the way that you treat them and the way that you interact with them, if a guy goes, wait a minute, oh my goodness, I didn't know that that was a thing, and then starts opening the door for you, well, now you've, you've started to help him understand what you're looking for for a man. And so you've got to be able to, to raise the bar and to see if that person's going to go, oh, I'm so sorry, or I'm not doing it. And then you'll know. Because here's the sand or here's the foolish thing to do. Is that if we start disregarding these red flags, what we're doing is we're lying to ourselves. And that's typically what happens, right? A red flag goes up and what do we say? Let me give this person the benefit of the doubt. And and I'm telling you, when red flags go up, I, I think I'm in like the high 90s whenever a red flag goes up and you're, it's accurate. Because typically when you see something and you go, that's not right, it's not right. And so when it comes to picking leaders, when it comes to picking elders, when it comes to dating, whatever those, those, that plumb line is that you're looking for, you got to stick to them. Because it's going to be dealt with one way or the other, right? When we talk about dating, you know, there's different things that you can look for. If you're, if you're dating a guy and he treats his mom terribly, it's just a picture of how he's going to treat you. And, and, and if you go, oh, no, 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 his mom's just a tough cookie, well, you're going to be the tough cookie in a little bit. You're fooling yourself. But if you were to say, listen, I don't like the way you treat your mom, well, then he has the ability to then look on and go, oh, my goodness, I never noticed this. And you got to deal with it right when it happens. And so when it comes to elders, gang, this is how we pick. This is what we look for. But let's move on. And it's interesting how he moves into this next section because he talks about the enemy. And he says in verse 8, be sober, be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. I find it so interesting that after he talks about leaders, he then talks about the enemy attacking. And it, I, listen, I don't really enjoy talking about elders and deacons and what we should be looking for in pastors. But the reason why I share this is, is that we as a group have to do this together. We as a group are going to be picking different people. And so it's important because the enemy is after us. And as a group, he's after us. He doesn't like that we're meeting at a church, at a YMCA. He doesn't like it that more people have been coming and growing in their faith. And so he wants to attack. So we've got to be vigilant. But he's also talking about individually. So if you look back here, he gives us a couple things to do. So first, be sober. Be sober. For me, that's a, that hits me right in the chest. 
because I'm a person that struggled with alcohol. Now, as, as we talk about being sober, it can also mean be watchful. But for me, it is literal. I, I know what would happen if I started drinking again. And, and that, that's one of the things that I truly believe that I, I think you got to be careful of, especially church leaders. I was just sharing this last week that I've heard different pastors talk about that it's okay for pastors to drink alcohol. And I think every pastor that I've ever heard teach that message has fallen into sin and is no longer in a, a position of leadership. It's one of those things that I just think that the leaders of the church have to look on and go, oh boy, this is delicate. And I understand that that ruffles some feathers. I've heard stories about other pastors in Italy and in Europe where drinking wine and these types of things, it's just normal, and I get it. But for me, I've abused it too much, and I I struggle with um, not being sober because I know that just all it would take for me is one. And so I I take this very literally. You don't have to. It's just the way that I, I look at this scripture is I think it is very literal for me. But then he says, be sober and be vigilant. Now, there are a lot of different verbs that you could put next to vigilant. But one of the best ones that I heard, you know, it's to keep an eye out. Don't sleep. Don't snooze. Be watchful. But then another one that it had said when it was trying to define this word vigilant is to keep yourself in remission. I thought, man, that is so good. You know, if you've ever talked with somebody that is in remission, and let's say that it's for cancer, right? And they find out that sugar ends up feeding the cancer. You know, the person that you can either go, well, you know, I can't cut out all the sugar. Or you could be the person that is vigilant and goes, I don't want cancer again. So get the blizzards and the M&Ms away from me because I'm done. Right? And then, you, and then what happens to that person? You know, somebody comes in with blizzards from Dairy Queen and goes, you know, it's your favorite flavor. And the person that is vigilant goes, get that away from me. That's, that's poison to me. And that's the way that we're supposed to be with the enemy. You've got to be vigilant, especially with what you struggle with. I know my struggles. And I've had to go in and put things into place to protect myself. And that might be totally different than where you're at. But you've got to be honest about those things and then you've got to be vigilant, watchful, don't snooze. Because look at what it says. Because your adversary, Satan is your adversary. He is out to get you. He wants to kill you. He wants to steal everything you've got. He wants to destroy your marriage. He he cannot stand you. And it says that his language when he speaks is that it's, it's lies. Because you can't trust anything that he says. And it says your adversary, the devil, it walk, walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And that's spooky a little bit. He just trots around looking for who's next. It reminds me of, let's flip to Proverbs chapter 7. It reminds me of this woman that is described, that Solomon describes in chapter 7. Of just somebody that prowls around. And as you go through the book of Proverbs, Solomon gives this warning about... Um, falling into adultery. And he kind of describes this, this woman to watch out for. And he calls her, you know, a, a harlot. And in chapter 7, he really goes into to how she works. And this is what the enemy, this is kind of, a, this is a good picture of what it looks like. In chapter 7, it says, now listen to this woman that is described. For at the window of my house, I looked through my lattice and I saw among the simple, I perceived among the use, a young man devoid of understanding, passing along the street near her corner. And he took the path of her house in the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night. And there was a woman, and there a woman met him with the attire of a harlot. In a crafty heart, she was loud and rebellious. Her feet would not stay at home. 
At times she was outside, at times in the open square, lurking at every corner. So she caught him and kissed him. With an impudent face she said to him, I have peace offerings with me. Today I have paid my vow, so I came out to meet you diligently to seek your face. I have found you. I have spread my bed with tapestry, colored coverings of Egyptian linen. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love until morning. Let us delight ourselves with love, for my husband is not at home. He's gone away on a long journey. He's taken a bag of money with him and will come home on the appointed day. With her enticing speech, she caused him to yield. With her flattering lips, she seduced him. Immediately, he went after her as an ox goes to the slaughter or as a fool to the correction of the stalks till an arrow struck his liver as a bird hastens to the snare. He did not know it would cost his life. This is the part that's spooky to me. Therefore, listen to me, my children. Pay attention to the words of my mouth. Do not let your heart turn aside to her ways. Do not stray into her paths. For she has cast down many wounded, and all who were slain by her were strong men. Husbands in the room, you should underline that. Her house is the way to hell, descending to the chambers of death. That part has always stuck out to me because it's almost as if some people, you know... You and your marriage are like a trophy. You're a challenge. And there's ladies just out there like this, or there's men that are trying to seduce you, and you're just a trophy to them. And it's difficult because you don't know it at the time. It could be your coworker or this person here, and they start talking to you, and the next thing you know, hey, let's do a work project together. And, it, and, and so often, it's, it's like, what does it say here? Immediately, he went after her as an ox goes to the slaughter. We don't know that we're being led to the slaughter. And the next thing you know, the door locks and it's over. And that's the way the enemy is with us. Because sometimes we go, listen, you know, Satan's not that bad or my coworker's not they're not really out for that. And the thing that we start telling ourselves is, is that I can dialogue with the devil a little bit. The thing is, you, you, you can't. We're not strong enough. He's a jerk. And he knows, he knows us. He knows our weaknesses. And when you think about it, it's not really a fair fight because the devil works in the spiritual. And we don't, we don't typically see the spiritual, right? We see the flesh. The book of Ephesians, it talks about that this battle, it's, it's spiritual. And typically, you know, we can even tell ourselves this actually isn't happening. The problem is, is that he's real. He's very good at his attacks. <clears throat> and so we have to be careful. I, I think it's so spooky at the end where it says that many, all who were slain by her were strong men. One of the best messages that I have ever heard preached about protecting yourself from adultery is from a pastor who just recently fell into adultery. One of the best marriage sermon series that I've ever heard was from a guy that was cheating on his wife. And what I've learned from these is that you, just, you can never take it for granted. You just, the enemy is patient. If it takes him 15 years or 20 years to get you, he's got time. And you can't act like, hey, I got, I'm, 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 I'm fireproof. Because you're not. So you've got to go back to what did, first, what, did, uh, what did Peter say? He said, be sober, be vigilant. And then he says in verse 9, resist him. Steadfast in the faith. Resist him. The word resist means to set oneself against or to oppose. So Satan's not your buddy. He's not not here to make things easier for you. 
if you think about it, you go, well, you know, what, what should I say whenever these attacks come? What should this husband have said to the crafty harlot? Nothing. <laughs> get out of there. Right? When you get to the point where things are starting to cross these lines, where the, your coworker, you know, says, hey, why don't we go and grab some coffee? If you're not able to talk that over and discuss it with your spouse, then you shouldn't be doing it. You've got to put these things in place to protect your marriage. If you go, okay, well, I'm single. I'm single. What do I do? What, you tell me I'm not supposed to go on a date? Well, no, you've got to figure out what you're, what you're trying to protect. And then you stick to it. If you're dating and you struggle with you know, falling into sexual sin, then you've got, to, you've got to protect yourself. You've got to look on and say, okay, if I want to live a life and if I want to save myself from marriage, and these are the things that I'm going to have to put in place. Okay, but what practically, what does that look like? I, I don't know what that looks like for you, but you've got to sort those things out. Whether that means you go on group dates or you don't keep yourself alone, I, I don't know. You know, well, my struggle isn't dating, it's speeding. What am I supposed to do? I mean, you know, I don't, I don't know. Put a governor on your car, find a way that you can protect yourself from speeding. Whatever it is, you've got to practically look at it and say, the enemy wants to take me out when it comes to this area, and I'm going to be vigilant. I'm going to, be, I'm going to resist him. I'm not, going to, I'm not going to talk with him and go, okay, how far can I go? No, no, no. You look at him like you look at the crafty harlot. No, you want to destroy me. You want to put me as a, as a trophy on your case. I, I can't do that. So he says, resist him and be steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. Let's pause right there for a minute, because here's the thing. It says that our brothers are going through the same exact thing. And what it comes down to is that we have an eternal calling. It says verse 10, but may the God of all grace who called us to his eternal glory. And so here's the thing. Here's the thing that's what's interesting about Satan's big end game. Is that first off, he doesn't want you to give your life to Jesus. Once you do that, you're saved. Jesus says, once I have you in my hand, I can't take you away. Okay, so then what does Satan do? He wants you to fall because God has a calling and work for you to do. So you're saved eternally, but then the time that you still have on earth, you have work to do. So he wants to destroy it. Think about it like with Billy Graham. Billy Graham preached to like a billion people. So if you're Satan, just for one minute, put Billy Graham over here and go, I don't want to have that happen. I see how gifted he is. I see how people respond to it. How would you attack Billy Graham? Well, you discredit him, right? One affair, and that ministry goes down the tubes. So what did Billy Graham do? Billy Graham put these things in place that for a while people respected. Right now, people are kind of looking at them silly, but he put these principles in place to protect his marriage. And my wife and I have done a couple of them. Billy Graham never rode in a car with a woman of the opposite sex. Not that he didn't necessarily trust him or this woman, but he didn't want to put himself in that position. He didn't ride in an elevator with somebody of the opposite sex. Again, he just didn't want to put himself in that predicament. Different pastors have put things in place. When they go on a, on a trip or if they go speak at a conference, they take another pastor with them so they don't spend the night alone from their family. And I think that's incredibly wise. Now, right now, it's being attacked. Some people say that's, that's silly. Men should be able to go and you know, have a meal with somebody of the opposite sex without thinking about falling into an affair. Well, I, I get you in a perfect world. The problem is that there's been too many of us that have fallen into it. So you've got to put these things in place. And I'm not trying, you know, here to tell you what you need to put in place, but you've got to do something, whatever it is. And then you've, you know, you've got to work through them. My wife and I have some of those rules in place. So she might get a text from me, hey, honey, I'm going into a meeting with somebody of the opposite sex. There's no way for me to get out of it. And why do we do that? Well, if somebody walks by the office and they see me going into a woman's office and they say to my wife, hey, did you know your husband was having a going into a meeting? Oh, yeah, I know. He texts me about it. So we put some of these things in place just to protect ourselves. And you go, Ben, that's not my struggle. My struggle is coveting and, and spending money. 
Well, when it comes to the holiday season, you'd better find a way to put some guardrails in. If you say, I'm going to spend this amount of money on Christmas, right? You put that in place. And then if you go over it, get somebody in your life to go before I spend, let's say it's 400 bucks, right? I'm not going to spend more than $400. If you're looking at something that's 450, then put something in place where you got to, you know, tell your pastor or somebody else that I'm going to get approval if it's 450. Doesn't mean that you can't spend 450, you come up with the number. But if you've put a guardrail in place and now you're about to go over it, have a conversation with somebody. Listen, I, I know I said 400. But um, this thing is 450. Well, last week you said that you're only going to spend 300, and now you've extended it to 400. And this is an area. And do you see now how the guardrail is helping you to stay on course? So no matter what it is, you've got to figure out those guardrails in your life and just put them into place because you have a calling. Right? And, and, and typically we look on and we think that the enemy, because we get sick or because we have this going on, that he's attacking us. He's actually attacking our calling. And he's just using these other things to get to us, to try to frustrate us. But every single one of us in here has a calling on our life. And God has said, I have this work for you to do and I want you to, to walk in it. And Satan comes alongside and goes, there, there's no way. I want you to walk in that calling, and so he's going to try to attack. You say, okay, what am I supposed to do? What do these guardrails look like? Well, let's go to the book of Ephesians real quick. I'm not going to read them because I'm over my time. But in the book of Ephesians, <coughs> Paul lists out for us how we battle. And this is the, the area of scripture <coughs> that is called the armor of God. Okay, and as you go through these things, these are things that you can put on every day. And these are spiritual things, right? You have the helmet of salvation. You have the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And so all of these things you can be putting on. And let's just take one of them because we're not going to get into all of them. But just take the sword of the spirit. That is one of our weapons that we have to defend ourselves against the enemy. That means that we've got to know the word of God like a sword so that we're able to use it. Think about when Jesus went face to face with Satan. Right? He tempted him three times. Satan brought him scripture. Jesus heard that scripture. He realized that he was using it incorrectly and he came back at him with scripture as a sword. He gave him truth. Right? And so one of the ways that you can get prepared is start knowing the word of God, especially in the areas that you struggle. So if you struggle with anxiety, what does the Bible have to say about anxiety? And that becomes your word of God so that when the attack comes from the enemy, you can start to counter. If you're a person that feels like, man, I feel condemned all the time. Well, there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. You start memorizing some of these so that your sword is sharp. Don't want to reach for your sword and have a wet noodle. You know, and you're grabbing some scripture and you go, that's not scripture, that's Lou Holt's quote. Right? The word of God is what you're going to defend yourself with. And this is your truth. And so you got to start getting prepared for your battle now. Let's go back to 1 Peter. So all of those are there for you to defend yourselves. Get to know Ephesians chapter 6. The armor of God is awesome. So then it says, by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle. Settle you. Now, those are four awesome things that it talks about that we should be doing within our calling. Okay? The Lord wants to perfect you. Next to perfect, you could write repair or to put in order. Hey, one of the things I love looking back into my time of being a Christian is I came in being a mess. Now I'm still a mess. I'm just not as much of a mess as I used to be. And that's the Christian life is that you're getting repaired. And so you're, you're being perfected. Hopefully next week when we talk, we're a little bit more along the path than we were today. And so as you're going about this and the enemy's attacking you, just know that we're on this path of perfecting together. He also says establish. Next to establish, you could write confirm. 
to be set on. Okay? It means that we're starting to get established in our walk. It means that we're not as much emotional, but we are established. Right? Or early on in my walk, I was very emotional. Right? I, I could, if I didn't talk to somebody about Jesus or things didn't go right, I just felt like I had failed. My pastor said, listen, man, it's just, you know, you're, you're, you're like this right now. You are highs and lows. He said, most of the Christian walk, you're going to be like this. Does that mean that you're never going to lead somebody to Jesus again? No, but it may not happen for you every day. That's okay. And I started to realize, okay, this is, this is good. This is, a, this is a good place to be. And so we're going to be established. And then it says strengthen. And the word here, strengthen, it's the only time that we see it used in the New Testament. It means to make one's soul strong. So our soul should be getting strengthened as we walk alongside others after Jesus. And then it says settles. Within our walk, we should start beginning to be settled more and more in who we are in Jesus. Learning about who he is. It says, to him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And then he says, by Silvanus, our faithful brother as I consider him. I have written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God in which you stand. She who is in Babylon, elect together with you, greet you. And so does Mark, my son. Greet one another with a kiss and love. Peace to all who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Now, the last point that we have here is, I think it's, it almost sneaks in at us, but it's awesome. So first of all, just a couple of things before we dig into it. Um, verse 13 is a really argued over scripture. Um, when it says she who is in Babylon, a lot of people talk about who is the she. It looks like it's talking about the church. Where is Babylon? We don't know. A lot of people look on and say Babylon is actually Rome. Peter was the pastor in Rome. So here's where a lot of the Peter was the Pope, and this was the very first church comes into play. And the problem that I have with that is that it doesn't say Rome. It says Babylon. And in the beginning of the letter, it, 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 he addressed specific areas. So why would he do specifics at the beginning but then be general at the end? I, I don't know. And that's why I struggle to say that this is Rome. Now, is there a good chance that Peter was writing from Rome and he just threw out Babylon? Yes. Is there a good chance that he was talking about just being in a wasted land like Babylon? Yes. Does that mean that he was actually in Babylon? Probably not because Babylon wasn't a booming city at this time. So you go, well, Ben, which is it? I don't know. You got to dig into that more. If you want to argue about it, that's fine. I'm not going to put up a big fight. But that's just one little nugget. Okay, so back to it. Here's what I like about this last section. Is that he's doing life with other people. And it's not just any other people. He says, by Silvanus, our faithful brother as I consider him. Now, this is really cool because Peter is shouting out the guys that he's doing life with. And next to Silvanus, you could write Silas. You go, Silas, who in the world is Silas? Well, Silas was also a ministry partner of Paul. So if you go back to the book of Acts, one of my favorite sections of scripture is Paul. <coughs> um, Paul is, is sent out with Silas. You remember what happened, right? Paul was with Barnabas. They had a disagreement, which we'll talk about in a minute. And he got teamed up with Silas. Now they go into a city and they're arrested for doing the work of the Lord and they're thrown into prison. And Silas and Paul are in these stocks together and it's midnight. And you remember the scene from one of my favorite sections of scripture. They start praising the Lord. And I don't know what it sounded like. Maybe it was like Amber and Rick and they're just sitting there and they're, you know, humble thyselves in the side. And they just start praising, right? And what's so cool is that there's this earthquake that happens. The jail splits and the prisoners, as they start to go out, Right? The prison guard, he goes to kill himself because he knows if anybody is let out of the prison, then I have to die for that. And Paul cries out, do not kill yourself. And the guy runs down at him and he goes, what, you know, what, what must I do to be saved? And he goes, give your life to Jesus Christ. And he gives his life to Jesus. And then his whole family gives his life to Jesus. And it's this awesome scene. That's Silas that's with Paul. 
And so as we were going through Paul's letters, we learned it is so important to have people to do ministry with. And this same exact guy is with Peter. In fact, we learned that he gets shouted out in many letters. So it looks like he was co-writing letters. He was delivering letters. And what do we learn from this is not only do we have to do life together, but other people have calls on their lives. And we have to help and encourage them in their calling as well. Little did Silas know that he would be such a warrior. That's Silas. And look what Peter says about him. Our faithful brother as I consider him. That's not it. He also says in verse 13, She who is in Babylon, elect together with you, greet you, and so does Mark, my son. You go, okay, who's Mark? This is really cool too. So in the book of Acts, when Paul and Barnabas go out on their first ministry uh, trip, they take this guy, John Mark, with him. Now, John Mark, something happens. Whether he gets scared, whether he gets something goes wrong, his dad, you know, called and said, listen, I need you back here. He probably didn't call because we know that didn't happen. But for some reason, John Mark goes back and Paul got really upset. And they, so they finish out their first ministry trip and they go to take off on their second ministry trip. And Barnabas says, we got to take John Mark with us. And Paul says, no way. I'm not taking that guy. He goes, we got to take him. He goes, no, we're not taking him. And they end up splitting. Barnabas goes with John Mark. Paul goes with Silas. Now, different times I've read that and I go, man, I just don't understand this. Well, there's different times where you won't understand the way that the Lord's doing things. But the Lord actually had two ministry teams starting to get ready instead of one. What's really neat about it is at the end of Paul's ministry, he says, bring John Mark back to me. Because John Mark had a very serious call on his life. You see, John Mark was picked as one of four people to author the Gospels. So when you go through and you read Mark, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that's who this person is. And isn't that awesome? Look at the callings that these, this group of people had on their lives. And so that's the mark that we see here, the mark that that wrote the gospel according to Mark. It has been said that Mark is Peter's point of view from the gospel. And so they're hanging out together. And Mark goes on to, to write one of the gospels. Incredible. And so he says, greet one another with a kiss of love, peace to you and all who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. So listen, as we look at <clears throat> these three things together, let's just go back and track them real quick. What is the wisdom and what is the foolishness for each of these areas? So first we talk about elders. The wisdom is we got to use 1 Timothy chapter 3, Titus chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 5 as our plumb line for picking leaders. The sand would be to fool yourselves and to not deal with the red flags that come. The second area that we talked about was the enemy. All right, the rock that we can stand on is get ready. He used a whole bunch of different verbs. Just grab one of them. Sober, vigilant, uh, resist, used all these different things. Listen, you got to get ready and you can get dressed with the armor of God to get prepared for whatever comes your way. It's foolishness to think that that's not going to happen. If, if Satan had no problem attacking Jesus, he will have no problem attacking you. And so just take one of those this week and go, how can I put this into place? Because it says that he is just, it's like he's stalking us around right now, looking at who he's going to go after next. And lastly, we got to do life with other warriors. You got you to do life with other warriors. You know, as you go through uh, the book of uh, the armor of God in the book of Ephesians, one of them is a shield. And what I always picture with this shield is that, you know, it, it, it actually says in Ephesians that Satan is shooting fiery darts at us. You go, what does this practically look like? Like, I, I, I know the symbolism. But what does it look like? Well, you kind of know what it's like. Like, you, you've had kind of a funky day and then you walk in the house, right? And there's like this 
thing that hits you of discouragement, or maybe it's an argument, or you're just like, like, where did that come from? Well, Satan's just trying to pick us off with these spiritual fiery darts. And it says that we're, we have the shield that we can use. And the thing that's interesting about how you use shields to protect yourself was that it wasn't just you. If you've ever watched the movie 300, you, you realize that they used to interlock their shields. Because if I just sit here with my shield and I'm protecting myself against the enemy, you know, I don't have anybody to protect my back. So what we have to do is Rich and Chris and Tom, Rick, as men, we got to lock these shields together. And the women have to lock our shields together. And as family members, we got to lock our shields together so that we have each other's back. Nick and Amy, Dom and Nicole, Megan, Allison, Allie, we all have to lock together. And that's how we protect ourselves from these darts. And what happens is when we see somebody that's going out and trying to battle on their own, we got to go, oh, no, 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 come on back. That's why we got to check on people. Hey, I haven't seen you around in a couple weeks. What's going on? Get back in here. Because it's foolish to think that we could do this alone. It's just never been set up that way. Christianity has always been a, a plural thing. And so that's where we'll close this week. <coughs> Stand on solid ground. I know that today is you know, not too much fun talking about how we pick leaders and pastors and the enemy. But this is a really strong word for us. And I pray this week that we would look at these things and say, how can I, how can I put these things into play in my life? Let's pray, and then we'll enjoy some fellowship together. Heavenly Father, we're thankful that we're able to come together, and we can, we can talk about 1 Peter chapter 5, and we can look on at the areas of our lives and go, man, first off, we, we are not alone, and I need help. Lord, we're thankful that you have supplied a church and a group of people and believers that we could do life together. <coughs> I know that this is a challenging time, Lord, because we have, you know, this coronavirus going on. You have all kinds of different things that are wanting to keep us isolated. But, Lord, even when we're not able to be together, put each other on our hearts. That we would be checking on each other and texting each other and messaging each other throughout the week and going, just let me let me make sure that that I am doing life together with other people. Lord, I pray for this group that we would be taking this chapter seriously and that we would be putting these things into play. And so, Lord, we're thankful for this time together. I pray that you would bless.